But two pur I have two purposes in the face. Now this is no beyond, eh? This is uh, me using beyond in applying to trauma. Incline. Huh? Incline. Incline. Yeah. Beyond never talk about trauma. I don't think Klein did either. However, beyond is all about trauma. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's implicit. But it's he say one thing that I usually quote, which is he, Freud say that psychoanalysis was like uh, uh, archaeology, was he tried to discover mm -hmm. ruins from the past. And beyond that, this is true, but the problem with the ruins from the past is that it's, they remain active until now, always expressing the sign of a catastrophe. So, which is what we're talking about, trauma. I'm using Plato uh, because for two things. I, I mean, Plato be, be became very much my interest in reading Memoirs of the Future and, mm -hmm. and Beyond because he talked about about the allegory of the cave there. Mm -hmm. And he said all the Greeks have been for centuries trying to understand what the allegory cave was, but they never have been able to to know, but he didn't say what he meant. So uh, he quote Christ of um, I don't remember exactly what he say about Christ. That's no, I cannot remember. In any way, um, so I, I I got involved in the, I got in Cape, but then I got involved with the Plato's theory of form because it's very much in Beyond's work. He mentioned continuously the difference between nomenon and phenomenon, mm -hmm. and the thing in itself is in Kant, and so on. So since my contribution on is to try to put together beyond in trauma, and it is the belief that there is a trauma that is ubiquitous to, and we will, I will be talking next week about your paper on that, so you're all invited. You say you're not here. Mm -hmm. I, will, I will miss you, but anyway. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, the concept of a preconceptual trauma. So I refer to preconceptual trauma as an ubiquitous experience that takes place in the first years of life and that is universal in the presence of every mind. Because it's a consequence of an equation of a relation between the helplessness of a child and the power of adults who, parents, who are usually, I mean not usually, always, ordinary people. We might think as children that our parents were chosen by God, but they they're just ordinary people trying to do the best, but but nevertheless, I mean, uh, end in traumatizing the children. So we are all traumatized. So let's not think about like Freud's thought of normal people and New York City people. No, there's no such a thing as normal people. We are struggling the best that we can with whatever we have, and that's it. Some of our trauma. I mean, I talk about that here when we talk about trauma becomes our identity, but. The preconceptual trauma, I believe, split the mind in two. In a traumatized part, in an, I, I prefer to say state, in a non-traumatized state. Mm -hmm. um, Beyond use psychotic and non-psychotic, but he used it, and it's my belief, mm -hmm. And Mel says something, I don't think it's completely my belief. I think that I'm, I'm plagiarizing Mel said that could come to my mind that I, I think he might say something about this. That when Klein referred for the first time on the paranoid schizoid position, people believe that she was talking about psychotic people, psychotic patients, mm -hmm. and not about all of us. So, I mean, that this is what the way that the mind was conformed. So, and this is why Rosenfeld, starting with Rosenfeld, who was a fantastic, very creative analyst, um, 
wrote The Psychotic State, which was a, a series of psychoanalysis performed on a schizophrenic patient, and everybody at that time was uh, doing, in the 60s everybody was doing, at the time when I was talking to Prados, everybody was involved in uh, doing psychoanalysis with schizophrenic, mm -hmm. that was the fashion. So in all the patients being published in Second Thoughts uh, are schizophrenic patient and all his concerns about hallucinations and schizophrenia and psychosis and so on. So the, this is the time, in 1965, when he wrote a paper between oh, the psychotic and non-psychotic state of the a part of the personality. He was asked many years in after after in in San Pablo about that paper of the psychotic and non-psychotic. And then this is what he said. He said at that time everybody was in the fashion to psychoanalyze um, psychotic patient. And then he said, just like the women wore feathers in the hat, psychoanalysts wore schizophrenic in the hair. So it was a fashion, in other words. So because of that, I decided, I mean, to use traumatized and non-traumatized state that I think make more sense if you're going to make it universal because after all the paranoid schizoid, it, does, it does, doesn't represent the, the mind of a schizophrenic, but the mind of everybody. So, uh, so the preconceptual trauma is split the mind in two. The traumatized part and the non-traumatized. The non-traumatized correspond to the normal biological development that we all go through from the time of birth to the time of death. So there is a continuous interaction between these two states. When the traumatized state takes over the mind, contains the mind, we become, we lose it. We become berserk, psychotic. When that happened, beyond say when the alpha elements self digest themselves. Uh, and he called that reversion of alpha function. And the opposite, when the non-traumatized contain the traumatized is an activity produced by the alpha function taking over. The reversal of alpha function, Beyonce is a, uh, uh, will produce usually uh, mm, hallucinations of the kind, he was talking about psychotic, but I think that you can extend that to non psychotic like to us. Uh, will produce an object that he refers to bizarre object. Bizarre object for him is different from, it's a beta element, but it's a different from beta element. Because the reversal of alpha function, I mean, when they reverse, they end producing beta elements. Because the alpha function digests beta element and change into alpha elements, or, and in this case, when the traumatized take over the non-traumatized, then the alpha function reverse the function and produce a form of beta element that he called bizarre object, because he said the difference is this. The normal beta elements are the consequence of a stored sensory perception that is stored in the mind, waiting for a mind to provide a meaning, to think. They are wild thoughts, but they are no, they have never been digested, they are virgin thought, where the bizarre object is an object that had been dealt with and then changed into beta element, but that beta element will contain easily ego and super ego elements. And that's the difference with the normal, not normal, but the, uh, low, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, undigested beta element. I'll give you an example that I always use it, which is the patient that is in, lying on the couch, and then uh, she's looking up to the ceiling and there is a, I'm watching myself a little spider that is walking between the, the wall and the, and, the, and the roof, in the corner. And then I, when they come to, when she's lying down, he walks to the middle and then she sees it. When she saw this 
father, she jumped and screamed and went to open the door. I said, what's going on? I mean, to that particular, at that moment, a very intelligent woman, very capable, we were talking about, she was a candidate, we were talking about some Oedipal issues, I remember, and she was really making sense in what she was really talking about. And suddenly, on the look of the spider, she became crazy. So, I we start to examine why, and we discover that the little spider was not so innocent, it was in her, her, her fantasies, it was connected to something that she still was feeling very guilty about. She was the older sibling of two, and there was a younger little boy that she, sometimes at night, she hated him because, well, coming after her, took the plate, whatever, I mean, you know, the sibling rivalry between um, siblings. She would get his hand and have him walk over her body and her genitals. So, and in order to get sexual excitement, sexual around. So, obviously, the little spider wasn't the little spider. It was have elements of ego and super ego projected in it, and this is what became so threatening. So, that is a bizarre object. The bizarre object is the object, for instance, that induces phobia. You know, the most uh, um, easy way to look at it is the, 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 the object that generated. Uh, that produce a nameless terror, I mean, through a phobia. So, uh, now, there is always an ongoing, uh, Freud talk about reality testing. Reality testing is like the antennas of an insect. It would allow us to perceive reality and discriminate outside world to inside world, continuously. What belongs to the outside, what belongs to the inside. Reality testing most of the time fail, but it was also will depend on the ego strength, the, the capacity to tolerate frustration. So of, often fail, and then I say there is a continuous entanglement, and I use an expression from quantum theory, you know, two particles that are even distant, one move, the other move, this type of thing. So the concept, I refer to traumas from the present as conceptual trauma, I mean trauma that were no big they were not contained by mind, but, but I mean, but it was a mind capable of containing, but failed to contain it. Where preconceptual trauma is a trauma that occurred when there was no mind to contain the trauma. So then the issue is that continuously, conceptual trauma triggers preconceptual. So I'm considering here four issues now, which is our, the, uh, the first one is the use of of um, of uh, Plato concept of form. Okay, the concept of form of Plato has two sides. Uh, one is uh, uh, one one one. Plato, Plato say that every existing object has an essential. Uh, idea, an idealized conception of every existing object. For instance, if I say to you that I saw something with two wheels that move, you know what I'm talking about. So, so then he said that every object has two sides. A face has two eyes and a, and a nose and a mouth, but no face equals to the other. It's always particular. So he said there are two sides of any object. The form with capital F which is the essential part of the object, which, which is, is ubiquitous, is, is universal to all ex, ex, existing objects of that quality. And a particular one that uh, uh, um, is related to a particular aspect of that object in, 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 in particular. So, meaning that, for instance, if I say to you, I saw an animal with four legs, I mean, uh, with a tail uh, that barks, you know, I'm referring to a dog. But I saw, I saw an Bailey with her dog, we don't know what dog I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. so, so there is two sides. There is a general one. So I say the same thing with trauma. There is a preconceptual trauma that is the form. And there is a particular trauma in relation to each of us that is unique. Mm -hmm. um, so this is why 
I use the concept of form to, to emphasize the fact that preconceived traumas are ubiquitous, where conceptual trauma are accidental. Well, this is what I liked about your paper, is that you brought uh, uh, the, one of the top philosophers from over 2,000 years ago, and Klein and Freud and beyond together to make something that really is quite solid. That's what I thought. I have always, all my life, I've tried to arrange marriage. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> it's all new. I remember but, once... In a, but in a unique way, yeah, I, you bring it together. I, see, but I remember, I, I, without, I knew about Bion, mm -hmm. that's many years ago. Um, I remember that I got involved with Piaget, very much involved with Piaget, and I, tried, I, I read, and I, I read a summary of Piaget's work, really, for students. And my problem was that, that I remember that somebody accused Piaget of um, being a, a, a psychology without affects, without emotions. I say it's true. There are no emotions in Piaget, in Piaget's psychology. Where Klein, it's all about emotions. I say, well, something is missing in between here. We need a marriage between Klein and, and Piaget, you know. And then, a few years later, I discovered Beyond. And this is what Beyond did. Mm -hmm. The concept of alpha function, beta elements, alpha element, is the link that was missing between the emotional aspect and the and the cognitive aspect. So that's an old habit of mine of trying to marriage. Well, the problem is that everybody's talking about the same thing. Eh? Yeah, in different ways, so it brings it together more yeah. three so dimensions. One of the things I learned from Piaget was only structuralism. Was what? Structural st structuralism. Yeah. I don't know. Is that where you pronounce mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. Which is this capacity to find what is similar in all existing sciences or, or vertices of observing a phenomenon. Because we are all watching the same thing now mm -hmm. in the same way that was watched a million, a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. So, what Plato was observed, Plato was the first person who talked about projective and interjective identification when he described the Allegro de Cape. Read it, please. Do read it. Mm -hmm. It's in the beginning of the seventh book of the Republica. Read it, and you will see the guy is talking about the projective and interjective identification. Now, of course, he didn't use a projector, he said a fire in the back projecting shadows in the front, in the cave. You know, there was no electricity, there was nothing, so he was using whatever. And he said, in order to enlighten yourself, you had to learn uh, uh, um, uh, astronomy, you had to learn philosophy, you had to learn logic. I mean, because of the love of the science of the time. He didn't say psychoanalysis, because, you know, psychology, because it didn't exist. But the guy has to think it in the right way, you know. Yeah. So, so then, you know, I, I, I was a good idea. I thought it was a good idea to use that. The, uh, um. Now, in relation to Klein, Klein referred to the paranoid schizoid, two, two types of paranoid schizoid position. One normal and one psychotic. The normal one is the one who is capable of, to, of mutating from a paranoid schizoid to, pro, to progress to the depressive position. The difference is to move from part object to total object. So, um, but she say that sometime the paranoid schizoid become a rigid position mm -hmm. and do not change to the depressive position. I think that the difference it is between the normal paranoid schizoid position is a, is a position of two objects. The good, which is the present object, and the absence of the presence of the, of the good object, which is the bad object. The bad object, she was the first one to talk about the presence of the absence. The bad object is the presence of the absence of the good object, but it is an object too. So, and this is what was important in one a client created. So, but when the, when the, uh, this reach extremes, and it is very difficult to say when, we can say when the protective shield Freud talked about cracks, breaks, when uh, the reverie 
um, from the mother fail uh, when the holding good holding object of Winnicott fail. Mm -hmm. I mean, then the good object, and, and you can see that with babies when when the absence of the object is prolonged and the baby gets into a rage, it will find it difficult to go back and and feed again and suck the breast again. <laughs> Klein interpret that by saying that. After a while, the amount of anger in the baby, the baby will have attacked the object, fears to suck again because of the paranoid feeling <coughs> coming from the absent object. So, at that moment, the baby has two possibilities. Either not to suck and then die of, of starvation, or to continue sucking. And the problem is solved by idealizing the good. So, and instead of two objects, then we have four. We have the good object, the bad object, the good idealized, and the bad persecutory. When the object reach that amount of split, then we have a rigid situation. And I refer to that is perhaps the um, essence of the preconceptual trauma. That a fact that could have been temporary becomes permanent. I always give the example of my daughter calling me that her child was about three or four was spitting everywhere. She was very upset because she's spitting me and she's spitting on the floor, she putting the tongue on the table, and she what is she doing? I said, Well it depends what you want. But she asked me, What what should I do? I said, depends what you want. If you want him to continue spitting for the rest of his life or to stop? And she said, Well don't be stupid, I want him to stop. I said, Well don't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually he will get tired of doing that. You know, it will give it up. But if you start with him to stop it, he will continue it. So you, it's your choice. Yeah. You know. So when parents come asking about um, potty training, I say, what potty training? What is potty training? Yeah. That's right. Because yeah. yeah. they, uh, they, they are creating it. The animal will train by itself when yeah. uh, the yeah. child is ready to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, the problem is, Running with human beings, we're too arrogant, so we always have a tendency to think that we know more than nature, so this is the main problem. So, the absence of the object becomes a presence, and then it is the presence of this absence that once become permanent is the core of the preconceptual trauma. I think this, to conceive the mind in that way, for me, have very practical use, which is every person that I see, I know that person has been traumatized. And all what I have to figure out is the core of that trauma, because all what is happened afterward is a repetition of the same. So, um, <clears throat> I say I mean, Freud said that the, you know, what happened with Freud was that he, he had everything clear in the 1800s about the, uh, the theory of the uh, of, uh, seduction theory, because everything was traumatic. He even talked about trauma entanglement. He said, he said his theory of uh, uh, this intermetology is usually related to, not, <coughs> not for issues, Things that are happening now are for issues happening when they were child. And the whole thing was there. <clears throat> and then we don't know if to believe Mason. I don't know if you've read Mason. There was a guy from here. Jeff. He was an Uruguayan here in Toronto. And he had the hypothesis that of the or what happened with Freud with the case of uh, Emma Epstein. I had the feeling we talked about this before. Did we? No, maybe with another class. I'm getting old. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and my Epstein is, is Irma case, the Irma dream case. I don't know if you're, fam you're, yes. you're familiar with that. <coughs> At the beginning, Freud was so lonely, so alone by himself, believing, imagining all these things, you know, all these ideas that were coming to him. And then, of course, at that time, I mean, even even if it is difficult for many people to understand these ideas now, imagine at the end of 1800s. So the guy discovered Fleece. Fleece was a borderline psychosis. 
But for Freud was a big discovery because Flynn was the only one who paid attention. But Flynn believed in numerology, numerology, that the numbers in your life would, let, I mean, would, would be able for you to know your future, you know. So, and also the worse than that, because at that time, husbands were not very happy about a doctor coming and examining your wife naked and putting his hand in the vagina, for heaven's sake, you know. That was a sin. You could do that. They have sheets and covering people around me, whatever. So he said, he came with the idea that the nose and the vagina were the same. And Freud believed that. That all what you had to do when a woman was suffering, whatever at the time, you know, discharges of this or that, and this is what people believe that had to do with the hysteria and nonsense, I mean, you know, the, the uterus moving around and whatever. If you examine the nose, it will be the same as examine the vagina. Well, my God, big discovery. No more problem with the husband. Let me see your nose. No problem. <laughs> so, so, and then at that time, Freud had a, a patient, Edmund Epstein, was a beautiful Jewish, very rich family from Vienna. And was his patient. And she was hysterical, like most of the women at that time. So, he allowed himself to be influenced by fleas. He, he brought fleas from Berlin to Vienna to operate on him abstain, operating on her, the nose, whatever, I don't know what they did, cauterize, mm -hmm. whatever, what he has to do to, to deal with the hysteria in the vagina and the eye, you know. The thing is that whoever did the operation, fleas or whoever, whatever did it, live about a meter long gaze, gas, 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 gas in the nose. Oh, yeah. And then everything became developed and smell that people, I mean, wouldn't get close to her. <laughs> I mean, and, and so that it was a horrifying thing for this family, for this girl, and they had to operate again. She lost the nose, she became horrible. Oh, I mean, and she almost died. So Mason say that because of that, it was a, such a shock to Freud, and he had many in his life, Freud. Mm -hmm. So it was a short shock that he really, and because in some way he also has all of these contra-transferential sexual desire for Emma, in the, because Emma is the one in my injection, which is show all the things in the, what is, you remember the name of the medicine? Meta, methyl, you remember that long name? Okay, anyway. So, that he changed from the uh, seduction theory to the uh, inner trauma of the Oedipus complex. Now, things have remained like that. Ferenci attempt to talk about trauma and things like that, but it was dismissed because Ferenczi got into trouble also with patients. And then it was, you know, and then his reputation and Freud wrote a letter about six months before he died, I mean, really, because he was in analysis with Freud, uh, so they got into conflict. And the thing is that everybody dismissed Ferenczi at the time as some kind of a crazy guy who was doing crazy things, and the things remain like that. I said, it's a simple thing. I mean, just like saying that that there is a trauma that is ubiquitous in everybody's mind, it is simple to say, because Freud said, the Oedipus complex, the, the, the superego is heir to the Oedipus complex. It is true. The superego is the heir to the Oedipus complex. But it's an Oedipus complex that is modified in everybody by the early trauma. I mean, it's not a big thing to think about. It. So yes, it's true about the, but Everybody have a particular, I mean, in every, they are the same characters in every Oedipus complex. There is a crossroad where the father is murdered, I mean, when he's a boy, and there is the mother's bed where the incest is committed. But the crossroad and the, and the bed is ubiquitous, particular to every existing mind. There is not one like the other. So there is a, so there, Beyond have a formula that of uh, um, K, K is he, what letter he uses? I don't remember the. Um, so, he, yeah, K. He's a K that represents the same characters in any myth. And the X, that he used the uh, X in, in Greek, which is the. Uh, 
the particular way of how those characters, how the drama uh, evolve in the, every particular individual. The characters are the same, the father, the mother, the son, or the, uh, the daughter, but how does this happen is a, a particular thing to, to everybody. So I refer to Keynes Keynes uh, Barrett, not Keynes Combe, Keynes Barrett. Why? Because I was amazed in reading about Keynes. I, 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 what, what do you think is Keynes Mark? Let's see. Do you remember? Oh, I remember about the, the, the Mark. What do you think God gives it, according to the myth of Cain, they give the, 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 the uh, Mark to Cain? He, he felt guilty. Uh, he, he felt it was too harsh a punishment to kill him. But he left the Mark so people would know who he was and stay away. Very good. That's very good. But not many people, me, me being very ignorant, thought that the mark was to mark him because he was a criminal. Yeah. Okay. So, but it was because of that. Which is, mm -hmm. doesn't make sense because how many people were in the world at the time? Trying to stay away. Not, supposedly not many. Yeah. <laughs> no. Only, only the king. Adam, Eve, and Cain. You know, when I was three or four and I heard that story, uh -huh. I thought that exact thing. I don't understand. I thought there were only <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so that's funny. But the, to me, the story went on that the people would avoid Cain. Yes, yeah, because of Mark. Because if they had anything to do with Cain, God would punish them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But the Mark was because of that, and not because he was a criminal. So I, 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 I use it as a, the Cain Mark is the Oedipus complex is a particular to every person. So I, mm -hmm. I wanted to to make a difference in saying, but. Is a K mark because I believe that the preconceptual trauma is a selective fact. You're familiar with that concept? Se selective fact. Mm -hmm. It's a selective fact that organized our life, made us the way we are, how we think, what we do. We are here, not by chance. We are here because of the particularity of our preconceptual trauma, one way or the other. And we know that because. We see that in our practice. So, so then I think it's, it's a, this is why Mercer talked about claustrum. He referred to claustrum because according to the trauma that, that we experience, we can be trapped in some part of the body of the, of the mother, say the head, the breast, the genitals, or the anal. And according to that, I mean, the characteristic of the trauma would be different, but I don't want to go into that. Now, the, the fourth thing that I referred about is the, transform, the transformation of the preconceptual trauma. Because in the, very, in, the, in the first years of life, I'm from birth to, I say, after latency, 11, 12, 13, trauma is like a tsunami. You don't see it. It gets, it, 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 it disappears due to the particular behavior of a child. But when adolescence starts to appear, when, when the mind starts to think in an adult way, we can see the first signs of the traumatic issue. Mm -hmm. So, then what makes the change from the um, traumatized state to the non-traumatized is it related related to many things, and I have I have made it I have made this graphic for you. You can have one, the two of you. Yes, we can share one. What? Well, then you can share one. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you see here, the traumatized and the non-traumatized. The traumatized state is environmental because it's related to how the superego is modified by the uh, circumstances of, of the first years of life. Usually, uh, the traumatized usually exercise a low frustration tolerance. There are four to five objects. 
five objects because Mercer invented a new objects. He produced the bad idealized. That he say is the object present in addictions, which I think is very useful. Could you explain it just slightly? Could you explain that? You, idea you, have, you have, you have the good, yes. which is the only object that is real. Eh? Mm -hmm. The only real object, the good object. Mm -hmm. Then the absence of the good, which is the bad, mm -hmm. the idealized good, mm -hmm. and the persecutory bad. Mm -hmm. But he say there is also a bad idealized. And he uses that to explain addictions. How in the addicted mind, the source of addiction is idealized as a panacea, something that will cure all your, all your suffering and, and this other thing. Who says that? Mercer. Oh. Donald Mercer. Okay. So time in the traumatized state is circular. So if repetitious, compulsion, repet repetition, compulsion is the consequence of the circular interaction. I don't want to get involved in that because it will be more complicated. Mm -hmm. Like um, I talk about bivalent objects, I say part objects are bivalent because they have two emotions involved, but that will be, will take us away from it. So the fraction, you know what the fraction is. The fraction is a phenomenon Freud described in relation to the wolf man. He says that the dream of the wolf, or the wolf man have as an adult, we were meaningful due to what he described happened to the wolf man when he was a little boy and he observed the pattern during coitus. And he described things there uh, amazingly that the child was sick with the temperature, was in the creep, I mean, got awakened by the noise of the parents making love. There was uh, 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 the, the position of the, of the coitus, uh, Freud described, it was from behind. I mean, uh, I don't know how, I don't think he ever say how he came to all those things, but yeah. it's amazing when, I mean, yeah. that he, he came to those things from the Wolfman. Uh, the Wolfman was a case, eh? the first thing he said when he came to see Freud was, I imagine how Freud might have felt when he said, could you defecate with your head down? That's the first thing he said to Freud when he came to see Freud. Well, he said to Freud. Yeah, he yeah. said to Freud. If you, with the head down, you know, can you defecate? Um, so that's what he, ref that Freud didn't really make a big deal about that thing <laughs> of the wolf man. He referred, he used a word in, in, in German that is Nachtrachtglickskeit. I don't know, those who speak German can do better than me, but anyway. Just little words put together. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, what your what, word, what, 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 do that. Yeah. But it, it means like afterwardness. Afterwardness, something that happened after. Mm -hmm. But he didn't provide any meaning to that. Something that happened after. You know, it was a, it's a common thing. In the translation in the Spanish or French, I mean, there is more meaning perhaps in German than in other language. In mm -hmm. Spanish, it was not meaningless. On the Lacan, and we owe that to Lacan, the guy really. Uh, made of that something meaningful, and he provide, give it the name in French of apricot, so which is also used. Another example of the of the collapse of time is transference and counter transference. Mm -hmm. And what I referred, I told you about trauma entanglement. So the element present in the traumatized state is the beta is it, are the beta elements are the beta elements now remember that i said at the beginning the uh, being referred to beta space alpha space and, and sigma space so this is the traumatized state belongs to to the beta space and the space is narcissistic for me narcissism is fusion eh? so for me, the, the name of narcissistic personality in relation to the inflation that um, the Americans have really talked a lot about that, mostly uh, Kimber, is not a metapsychological, it's a descriptive concept, it's not metapsychological because what, what Freud described in the secondary narcissism when the, it, it, the, um, the um, libido uh, is in, 
uh, I mean, is move away from the object and invest in the in the ego, and then that inflate the ego to a manic state. And this is what uh, um, Kimber talked about narcissistic personality. When you see the inflated state of the people who believe he's fantastic, and whatever. Inclined terminology is what. Is introjection of the idealized object? Very good. Very good. That's what it is. So that means that if we call that narcissistic, what about the introjection of the debased objects, or the bad objects, mm -hmm. which is depression? Mm -hmm. So is it that narcissistic too? Mm -hmm. yeah. My feeling is that you know that. Melanie Klein never talk about narcissism. The one who, no, who who wrote a paper, a very good paper, I was I think was in nineteen eighty three or something like that, was Hannah Siegel. That she started to say what Klein didn't say about narcissism. My feeling it was that she didn't want to have more problem with Anna Freud, which was already fighting. I mean there was a book written about all the things that they were throwing mm -hmm. at each other. And then some people say that they were both in love with Jones, and this mm -hmm. is what they were fighting about, because they, <laughs> they wanted to marry Ellen Jones, but anyway. <laughs> but I, I, it could be, because she never referred, and obviously, mm -hmm. there is no way that you can really mm -hmm. understand, I mean, accept secondary narcissism from a client point of view. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the, the catexis that is, a, 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 um, that takes place with a, a premises object could never leave that object. So that thing Freud talked about, like the libido, like a pseudopoda that goes there and can take the object and give it up, and it, that, you know, when that is takes place, that is remain like that forever. This is what is called object relation, because it is the relation with the object what remained in repeat, and those objects are repeated exactly as it took place, and we see that, we know that. So there is no such a thing as giving up. So, so narcissism for me is fusion, and it's a defense against separation. I think it's not a big thing. It's a space, it's a better space, it's a space of projective and objective identification, is the, is the being in the cave of Plato, thinking that the shadows are true. It's when a cigar is not a cigar. Then we if we talk about this, about the communication between the parts, use negative links in the traumatized state and positive links in the non-traumatized. And then we come to symbolization, which is the one we want to talk about. There are two forms of symbolization, continuous and discontinuous. And this is my creation, it's not beyond. So don't blame poor beyond of my own whatever I have invented myself. So, this continuous symbolization means when a break is produced between the original object and the reproduction of the object. When we know that the cigar is a cigar, when we know that our wife or our husband look like one of our parents, but it's not our parents. So that we are capable of getting married, we're capable of establishing a nice loving relationship, with something but different, who looks like one of our parents, and this is what we are attracted to, but it's not our parent. So that is a discontinued form of symbolization. And then the continued form of symbolization, so meaning that if the container looks the same, the contain is different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay? And the discontinue, I call that also heteromorphic. But in this continue, I use in topology here the word, I took the word of homeomorphism, um, heteromorphism from there. In homeomorphic or continuous form of symbolization, meaning when the containers look different, but the meaning is the same. And this is the object that we, this is the transformation we are interested in, because it meaning, meaning that through the Bio biological evolution of our mind, as we grow mentally, as we grow, as we grow in age, from childhood until adulthood, then the shape 
the container, the where the 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 shape, the the form, the the phenomenon of the preconceived drama change, but the meaning is always the same. And this is what is important. And that happened, according to Bion, because of a, a mechanism that he he didn't copy it because I don't think he we could never mention, but it was similar to what French referred to as the trauma being atomized, which is the same concept. We can talk about psychotic and then friendship about trauma. But it's the atomization of the trauma, the splitting, the minutely splitting in the projection everywhere of that of the preconceptual trauma. So what happens when you project everywhere is that you're missing the preconceptual trauma projected around every corner. So we are inside of the cave. We think we're dealing with a reality outside, but we're dealing with a narcissistic reality that we are projecting from ourselves. And that's what gives room to the transference and the counter-transference. So we will read here now some clinical illustrations in that sense. A young man very much involved with sports and suffering from a toxic psychosis induced by marijuana said that he was very disappointed with professional baseball because he felt the organizers were only interested in money, that there was not a genuine and unconditional concern about the games. However, as he spoke, tears appeared in his eyes, and I knew his parents were away on holidays. So I said, you feel that your parents don't have a genuine and unconditional feeling about you? Yes, he said with anger. I have called home several times and got no answer. The baseball game and his family were cognitively different, but emotionally the same, that is, continuous. Unlike discontinuous or discrete forms of symbolism, the links that combine the chain of associations present in the narrative of homeomorphic symbolism are made up of false or negative emotions, such as minus love and minus hate. You understand why? Now. Huh? Why is because it's false. Because mm -hmm. they don't really belong. Yeah. Mm, not so belong to you, not belong to the patient. And are only present, as, as I have already stated, in the psychotic uh, or traumatic part of the personality, which contains the emotional structure of the preconceptual trauma. The chain of associations present in this kind of symbolism is structured using different containers, carrying the same meaning or contained as can be observed, for instance, in the transference countertransference dimension, where the representation moves away from the original trauma without any jump or tearing. For instance, a patient who was operated on at the age of seven due to a spine defect developed the fantasy that the intervention was a form of punishment because she was not good, an emotion that could represent the contained. At the same time, because of this apprehension, she was continuously under the fear of being fired from her job because they might find out that she was not good. She was also unable to maintain a lasting love relationship because even if she was extremely attractive, as a defense she always fired men who approached her, trying to get rid of them before they could reject her. In the transference she continuously compile, uh, compiled in order to please as a way to avoid being expelled from therapy. We could represent the series of events using a chain of container contained interactions as follows. Did you develop that? Hmm? That formula? Did you develop it? Or was yeah. It? I like that. That's. Uh, you can have it. It's yeah. <laughs> for free. Yeah, I, I use it, but I'm using container container B on it. Mm -hmm. No, I know, I yeah. know, but it, it really um, points it out. It yes. really shows you yes. what, what he's talking yeah. about. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was like, oh yeah, <laughs> you get uh, it. I must give propaganda of my own. This is a chapter of a book that is coming out next year. I, 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 I don't know if I mentioned it to you. No, I'm not sure. You may have last week, but I say it again. Okay, but this is a book coming out, and then there is a particular chapter on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, with the case from the beginning to the end. Oh, okay. That it shows how it evolved using this... Uh, mm -hmm. There's a point about uh, what a quantitative dimension. Like yeah. everyone, right? 
okay, it's ubiquitous, has preconceptual trauma. Yeah. But <laughs> some people have it in spades. Yes. They, 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 quantitatively, it's a mess. And this patient, like, she was operated on at the age seven, and the, the way it's written is, it says, if this event, uh, and her con uh, understanding this was a form of punishment because she was not good, then went over all her life. I would suggest by age of seven she was already well aware <laughs> of this fantasy that it and in your terms. No, 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 no. Just that event it, of being offered. No, no, she became aware of that in the analysis. No, but it was at work before. The oh, oh of course, of course. The, the oh, origins oh, of it going From the very beginning, yes, yes, of course. Okay. It was a particular. Let me tell you about her. She, she was a born with a, a spina bifida occulta, mm -hmm. meaning that it, it creates some problem, but no, it's, it did not create paralysis. A beautiful girl, mm -hmm. no paralysis, but she was operated at the age of seven, mm -hmm. and the operations involved because apparently she have a, she doesn't remember it well because she repressed many things because at seven you could remember. Mm -hmm. She was incontinent, you're incontinent, and that created problems in school. She was oh, belly, yeah, yeah. and the other rejected her and things like that. So it was a big issue. Mm -hmm. So she was operated, and the operation, she was, they had research and had to put things through a vagina. Mm -hmm. and so the mother was with her there, but she, the people with masks came to rape her. Mm -hmm. They were raping her with the mother there, and the father wasn't there to help her. Mm -hmm. And that was all the things that she started to recreate. That you know that were part of the traumatic thing. Why was she? What was it done to her? What did she do? Mm -hmm. Was she playing with herself? I mean, why would they would do something horrible like that? Or mm -hmm. Was the father raping her with a with a mask? I mean, you know, mm -hmm. all of those things start to appear in dreams. Mm -hmm. in a, in a, in a, so then, uh, so that uh, this is a condensation of you know, but it was a really yeah. an ongoing. But I, I was also thinking in terms of infant observation or observations of me over time with mothers and, and uh, new infants. There's a, to use different language from attachment, there's a difference between a mother who, let's say, is, has, doesn't fit temper, temperamentally with her children or her child, that in some ways she fails them, but to use a Winnicottian term, she's good enough. Mm. Versus like a patient I have now. Whose mother was psychotic. Mm. <laughs> Watch out mm. from an early age, and then something you referred to here, but needing to please that mother took on a very. But the mother was dealing with projections all the time. Oh, oh, oh yeah, and to try and please her, mm. which is now part of the patient's pathology, trying to please everybody, mm. and she can't, and then she falls apart. It, it was so central, right? in contrast to. Temperamental misfit. Yeah. yeah, there are degrees of trauma. Degrees yeah. of trauma. That's right. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Versus the ubiquity of preconceptual trauma, but it might be ubiquitous, but there are varying degrees. Uh, it, it, it uh, there is a there's a ubiquitous <laughs> side and a particular side. Yeah, yeah. What? Sorry. There is ubiquitous side being that it's yeah, present okay. in everybody, okay. right? But it's also at the same time it's yeah, particular to each of us. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Let's consider another example, the non-psychotic or non-traumatized part of Mr. X, who is suffering from erectile dysfunction, was aware that his mother Mary, his girlfriend Betty, his friend Helen, even though they all look alike because they are all women, are also different. Something we could represent as follows. Uh, however, at the same time, the psychotic or traumatized part of Mr. X, dealing with equal <coughs> confusions, due to unresolved preconceptual traumas, was not able to discriminate between these women and conceived all of them as the same, as if they were all his mother. A dream brought by this patient provided a corroboration of what we had been dealing with for some time. He was following a woman who was rapidly moving through a crowd of people who were almost standing still. He followed her and managed to come to her side and experienced the fragrance and sensuality of her contact. They continued side by side and then came to a sidewalk that was too high for him to climb. But she, being now over the sidewalk and sensed by him as being extremely high, was giving him her hand to help him to ascend. The eatable desires related to other women present in his life and of their fragrance and sensuality 
were obvious and very familiar to him, so he felt his unconscious, in this respect, was not telling him anything new. We focus on the way the woman in the dream moves in contrast with the immobility of the crowd, how he caught up with her, and how imperceptibly he changed in the dream from being grown up to a little boy, as well as her changing from being any woman living in a crowd to being his helping mother. It was a graphic description of a topological transformation of an interaction that moved from a man and a woman to a child in need of his mother. Although Bion said little about negative links, such as negative L or negative H, I believe that positive links are related to true emotions, while negative ones would be associated with lies, falsehood, and evacuatory processes. The patient I am now referring to, who suffered from sexual impotence, was emotionally very ambivalent toward women because he harbored displaced emotions of anger and love, negative L or negative H, originally experienced toward his own mother. On the one hand, there was anger because his inability to obtain an erection resulted in incapacity to provide sexual pleasure to women, negative H, while at the same time, there was a displaced maternal need, negative L, for which he also searched in women. In women. Erotic transference represents a false love, or negative link, negative L, in the same manner that negative transference represents a false aggression, or negative H, because they are both lies, or displaced emotions. Similarly, emotions present between internal elements, for instance, a critical attitude from a superego element towards some regressive behavior, negative H, could represent a false attitude or identification resulting from similar emotions once exercised by the parents toward the child, positive H, that is now falsely repeated intrapsychically between internalized part objects. Some clinical vignettes may be useful. Sharon started her session by saying that the day before, after leaving the session, she went to see two houses that were for sale nearby, but which were far too expensive. Also, the school was on the other side of the main street, which would make it too dangerous for her son to cross. After a long pause, she continued talking about a subject that appeared to be different regarding a discussion she had with her husband concerning money, where he complained that she was spending too much money and not making enough. Up to this point, I was wondering if she was just referring to a real concern about the price of houses around the area where I live and about the inconvenience of the school location, or if behind this manifest narrative she was referring to something else, perhaps related to the proximity of Christmas break. I said to her that I was wondering if I was becoming too important for her, that she was finding this emotional closeness too, ex too expensive and even dangerous, possibly because of, uh, possibly because of the upcoming break due to, Christmas, uh, due to Christmas getting closer. She then added that her husband accused her of expending too much money on her analysis. After a short pause, she remembered a dream. She was accompanying her mother to the airport because she was traveling abroad for Christmas. But when they arrived, her mother informed her that she was traveling alone. She felt so frustrated and enraged that she pushed her mother to the ground. I felt that my presumption about her statement that houses nearby were too expensive and the location of the school too dangerous represented another narrative with another meaning. Her desire to get closer to me was expensive and dangerous. Noreen was another patient, a 48-year-old woman in her third year of analysis. During her annual checkup, her doctor found ulcerations in her rectum compatible with Crohn's disease, although it has been completely asymptomatic. This is very unusual, am I right? You they, I mean, to find ulcers without, ulcers without symptoms. Without symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. I've never heard of it. But this is very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. She had noticed that whenever she was has an argument with anybody, she tightens her anal sphincter. She is very angry with her father-in-law after he accused her of being only interested in money and also because he sided with her uncle who accused her of keeping some jewelry from her mother after she died. 
Whenever she thinks of her father-in-law or her uncle, she tightens her sphincter. It is automatic, she said. When she was around three years old, Noreen was placed for several months with a family who was unknown to her. This preconceptual trauma left important emotional scars that were visible in the transference countertransference interaction, like an as-if personality, always ready to comply and feeling lost in the other's desire. Very often she handled interpretations as if they were something absolutely alien to her. For example, she provided no response, neither agreeing nor disagreeing, and frequently at the next session she might refer to that particular interpretation but remain totally uncommitted, as if it were my own affair. She might ask a question, for instance, Doctor, yesterday you said this and that. Did you mean this or that? And I might answer, Well, I meant that what do you think? Oh, nothing. I, I just wanted to be sure. I had the feeling she was continuously robbing herself of any right about anything I said, always remaining uncompromised as if she were still feeling threatened and paralyzed with terror, perpetually in her mind, living at the stranger's house where she was placed. I pictured her as a little girl, crying profusely and holding tight to her belongings, perhaps a doll. Possibly a year after she was placed, um, after she was placed, her mother came to fetch her. I suggested to her that perhaps her need to please and comply were connected to that time, when she went back to live with her mother but was not clear why she was given away or why her mother wished to get rid of her in the first place. I believed she might have been absolutely terrified at the threat of being placed again or left wondering if she would even be killed. She learned to comply and to hide her anger in order to survive to the present time. The need to comply, her tendency to tighten her sphincter when she felt resentful and the asymptomatic colitis could represent her terror of her own aggression. Continue. We know since Freud that the unconscious can disclose itself using different channels of communication. The latent side of the conscious discourse, which portrays hidden, cognitive, private, and constantly conjoined facts, represents a narrative of substantial importance that speaks of other issues, habitually pointing to the next communication. It is similar to the process of dream thoughts, representing an emotional narrative of continuous symbolization that follows a homeomorphic transformation. This, al <clears throat> excuse me, this always portrays an infantile preconceptual trauma which repeats itself endlessly in a sort of perpetual motion that will, de um, that will uh, delineate the transference, countertransference dimension. There is always, however, a hidden lead, a scent, that reveals the repudiated contents, a sort of invariant that in spite of the topological, top, top yeah, logical transformation, points to the original preconceptual trauma. Noreen starts a Monday session by saying that she was trying to recall what I said yesterday, but she could not remember. She felt some cramps during the weekend that she attributed to her colitis. I said perhaps she was dealing with an internal baby that angry because of the weekend separation was refusing to feed from my breast by discarding anally what I fed her with. It would be like a baby that refuses to grow. She remembered when she suffered an anaphylactic shock and almost died after ingesting food that contained nuts, and how after that experience she started for the first time in her life to express anger toward her mother, something she had not been able to understand. I said that perhaps she feared I could poison her if she were to express her anger openly. And because of this fear, she preferred to use her anus to attack me silently instead of doing it out loud with her mouth. Okay. 
This meant that although in the chain of associations the symbol could change, these associations are contained by the same representation and the link is usually negative k, an invariability that when changed into positive k becomes extremely useful because it represents the substance to be used in order to fabricate the interpretation. It is this invariant contained that betrays the unconscious uh, repudiated content usually projected in the transference. It epif its epiphany and intuitive grasp was tagged by Bion as the elusive O that when discovered and isolated becomes the substance from which the interpretation is assembled. In other words, it is what the unconscious is talking about and can only be grasped by means of intuition and dreaming the session as observed in dream thoughts. Uh, I liked that. I think I underlined it. Uh -huh. I liked that. Um, there was something about it I liked. What I don't know like? if, if anybody else. Eh? Um, that it, it sort of gives a, a freedom to um, to the therapist, in a way. Well, what Vian say about the dream meditation is to use that aspect of, half, of unconscious alpha function mm -hmm. that operates when we are dreaming, when we are sleeping and dreaming. Mm -hmm. So then we, it will remain in a state of trance, no memory, no desire, no understanding, with a blank mind, we could dream. Because it allows a thing, your 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 alpha thoughts to float more instead of being connected tightly connected to things. Yeah, we can put it in those, in those terms. Well, I mean that's what I envision. Yeah, it could be in the term. Yeah. A, a sense of a total freedom that that then that allow intuition to operate. Yeah. And then you grasp things in your mind that eventually you would not if you were to be thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Or remembering or desiring. So I don't know if anybody else wanted to comment on that, or should I go on? Okay. It is important to know how the unconscious speaks in order to understand what exactly in the unconscious discourse would be meaningful for the analyst to listen to in order to understand. In another session, Noreen stated that she had an argument with her husband because she wanted to put a picture in a portrait and asked for his help. He fixed it, but did not want her to touch it afterward because, he said, her hands were dirty, something that infuriated her. She described experiencing similar feelings with her mother, who always preferred to keep her opinions to herself. She also wished for me to tell her what to do. I said she deprived herself of any value and gave it all to her mother, husband, or me. It was like the relationship of a little girl to her parents in which the little girl knows nothing and they know it all. I said that perhaps she felt that having a mind of her own capable of providing her with her own judgment was subversive and criminal. Perhaps she tried to keep her mother alive but knowing nothing, never thinking as she does with me. If I think I am alive and she is dead, I cannot be killed, but if she thinks I will be dead like her mother, this terrifies her. It is like either one plus zero or zero plus one, but never one plus one, like all or nothing. She then said that she felt as if I were something that is holding her together, that I have become essential in her life, and she cries. I felt she was like plucking the daisy, Love me, love me not. Forgetting was a way of getting rid of me, while making me her backbone was like bringing me to life again. This might be what she experienced as a child toward her mother after the latter abandoned her and did not come to take her back. In summary, we should consider the following. I am implying here that the narrative of the unconscious similar to consciousness, involves how does the unconscious talk and what does it talk about. I will refer to the former as the form and to the latter as the meaning. Will consciousness manifest 
talks using signs form. It usually refers meaning to desires, memories, and reality. The unconscious, on the other hand, talks using discontinuous or heteromorphic symbols, form, and usually, not always, refers meaning to homeomorphic transformation of pain, preconceptual traumatic emotions that have been repudiated by the preconscious. The unconscious will be talking about many issues, but from the practicality of, consult of the consulting room, we are mainly interested in those matters of meanings related to the source of the patient's suffering. And this, I believe, is always associated with preconceptual traumas, primitive emotional memories that determine the person's own idiosync idiosync idiosyncrasy and become meaningful in the transference, counter-transference dimension. Um, I thought that was a really interesting concept about um, keeping her mother alive in her by not having her own thoughts. Mm. Um, in that adolescence, when they st what brings up the trauma, I think, has to do with do I let go of that dependency? And what's going to happen when I step out? Am I going to be okay? <coughs> Is my mother going to be okay? Mm. Can, can I come back in a different way? Is that going to be acceptable? So there's all those... This is typical for Because the adolescent become trapped between a tremendous ambivalence. Mm -hmm. Because if they try to break away, they feel that they are murdering the parent, and they feel extremely guilty. And when parents are really strict, it's worse. Of course. Yeah, the murder is more yeah. intense. But if they give in and become the mother's desire, mm -hmm. an, an, an inhabitant of the claustrum of the mother, they feel very angry. Yeah, yeah. For instance, that patient that I talk about, the um, guy about that confuses the uh, uh, the game with the family that was referring about money being, remember the guy that was, he was a psychotic, a toxic psychosis produced by um, chronic users of marijuana. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, oh, 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 the main problem with him in what, when he came was that he was traveling in an endless way. Um, he disappeared one day, and the parents didn't know where they were, where he was, and they had to f try to find him through the um, credit card, and mm -hmm. they discovered him in Paris. So he has taken a plane and go away. So they went there and found him like homeless. I mean, dirty, really terrible, mm -hmm. and then brought him back home. And then, then he would disappear again. He would go walking for three days in the middle of the winter. So he was struggling because the problem with him that he was so angry about not being able to separate from, from a, a psychotic mother mm -hmm. that he did what Freud said that it was a flight to psychosis in order to remain trapped. But at the same time, he was trying to really move away, mm -hmm. but in a concrete way by using the geograph geographical distance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I told him, look, you can be inside of that closet, or the closet, that closet, and you can be in China. But you can be in China or be inside of that closet. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. have nothing to do with the outside, it has to do with inside. Mm -hmm. you know? So he started to understand that, that he became aware that really what he was trying to struggle was to separate, to really move away from the, It was an anal claustro. He was even mm -hmm. living inside of a psychotic mother, you know, that that for, for whom he was like a, a, a prolongation of her, you know, like a part of her. Yeah. So this yeah. is, and then uh, this is why suicide is very common among adolescents. Because from that trap, that if they move away, they kill the parent, but they stay, they kill themselves. Yes. Yeah. The only way out that they find is suicide. Yeah. Yeah. But that's very common in adolescents. Yeah. 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 Return to Noreen. Uh, mm -hmm. 
to return to Noreen, uh, the, as you describe it again, a preconceptual trauma of her being placed at three years of age. Again, I would suggest the preconceptual traumas were there all along. Yes. One thing that distinguishes, I think, two and three year old from younger infants is they begin to develop a voice. That's right. Uh, Absolutely. My great niece, her favorite word when she was two and a half was no. Yeah. Uh, I would really think that this mother, who sounds to me psychotic, uh, could not tolerate such individuality, such a statement of no, or any expression of an opinion that was deviant from her. So she learned to shut up. Absolutely. Except with her anus. Right. <laughs> the, yes, yes. Yeah. She pointed she, out she, that was the safe orifice. Any yeah. disagreement was and murdering the mother. It, it, well, yeah. and uh, the mother was the, mm. the murderer. In fact, destroying yeah. this girl's individuality. And mm. wow. <laughs> Well, this is interesting. It's very impressive. This is a very interesting um, case. The problem with her was that she started. I mean, one of the issues I have mentioned here, one of the problem of preconceptual trauma, is that we all have an unconscious tendency to reproduce it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like we recreate the drama. Mm -hmm. We find the characters and act it out in our everyday relationship, according to, I mean. The, pre the profile of the preconceptual trauma. For her, was to become isolated. She fought with everybody. I mean, her father-in-law, her uncle, her grandmother, and the only person was the husband. And she was continuously ready to divorce. I said, well, what are you doing to yourself? You have no family. or when you have this guy, who is good or bad, I mean, human, limping, not the fantastic guy, but still with you, I mean, and me. So it would be easy to break with me to bring your husband, keep your marriage, and you want to break with somebody, well, break with me, but I mean, you're going to isolate yourself completely. Mm -hmm. At the end, you're not going to have anybody. Mm -hmm. So you are continually placing yourself in the, in the same situation you experience as a little girl when you have nobody but alien people. But it was very obvious in her. This, uh, mm -hmm. there, is a, there is a lot, because uh, here this is a summary of, of many chapters in the book. Mm -hmm. But, um, um, you know, I, um, well, but you write people, you have no problem understanding and following. Oh, I, it, it packages the issues really, I think, really well in a way. It really gives the therapist a concept of to keep in mind of, in a way of how to work, how mm. to think of it. So I, I, I very much liked it. Well, it's mostly about it, I think, the transformation, the homeomorphic transformation. But tell me something. Does this add anything new to you that you don't didn't know in this paper? I I think that the clinical illustrations of transformation are very helpful um, because in beyond there aren't so many clinical no. illustrations it's no. very dense very theoretical no. and I find that when I have a clinical illustration I'm better able to understand the theory and the theory stays with me mm. It, otherwise, um, it, it involves more memorization and uh, it doesn't stay with me. So I think that this, this use, this, these clinical illustrations were very important. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the concept of preconceptual trauma mm -hmm. I found very mm -hmm. helpful. Mm -hmm. like I am, very well trained in child psychiatry and child observation, mm. but that's uh, you know observation. And, mm. uh, this is a psychic uh, mm. concepts where you know a lack of fit between an infant and mother becomes translated into a preconceptual trauma, mm -hmm. which then, mm -hmm. as you give it, it has meaning in terms of an adult's function, which uh, I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I. I you see, well, all, all from a psychopathology, a traumatic. Mm -hmm. And uh, psycho what happened 
<coughs> I think more in North America than in Latin America, for reasons of, um, uh, I would say, of capitalism, perhaps, mm -hmm. is that here in North America... <laughs> you mean Venezuela or, or here, the, the capitalistic... Uh, in Venezuela too, but uh, <laughs> is in Latin America, perhaps right. it, there's more poverty in things like that, or the weather. It could be, I mean, it's not as obvious as uh, it is in North America. For instance, in, in Latin America, psychoanalysis is idealized. Psychiatrists look up to psychoanalysis in North Latin America. Here is different. Psycho psychoanalysis look up to psychiatry. They feel ashamed that our science is not precise. We're always making excuses and trying to, uh, uh, I mean, apologetic of that it's not oh, precise, it's not exact, as it's the what? exact science. Is it go to Barry, the psychiatrists are what? God. Yeah, but I, I look at it in, at a different way. The psychiatry, in my contact with them, as patients and with the, with the greater uh, group of uh, psychiatrists that manage, are prejudicial, looked down to, or discriminatory against psychoanalysis. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we can try and express our well, concepts, refer to, you know, very good studies showing the efficacy of psychoanalysis and psychoanalytic psychotherapy. They've never even heard of it. No. And no, we're sir. talking to big pharma when we talk to them. And don't forget it. So, <laughs> I don't think we're a pop Maybe I'm not a yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it is what, is that that in, in, in that one thing is the that North American structures are more obsessive, so they they idealize more precision and exactness. Mm. Where there in the tropics, you know, people are no uh, the, the weather is so benign, and so that people are not, I mean, no, n not in need of planifying the future ahead of time because of the the uh, dangers, the weather, and whatever. So. I don't say that one thing is better than the other. It's a different mm -hmm. attitude. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that the, um, I always say if if I were to have a, a, a plane, an airplane, mm -hmm. and then uh, we need a mechanic, I would never look for a Latin American mechanic. I look <laughs> for a Canadian for sure. But if yeah. I were to need a witch, I would never look for a Canadian. I go uh, to the Caribbean. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know. That's a really good point. I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so one of the things here is that it, the um, psychiatry has too much influence on psychoanalysis, mm -hmm. and this is why you see, for instance, that pers uh, narcissistic personality, which is a this is, is a descriptive um, um, pathology. Mm -hmm. I mean, the psychoanalysts use it when and then don't pay attention to the fact that depression is also narcissistic. So narcissism get very confused what what is about. Mm -hmm. So, and then the same thing about psychopathology, mm -hmm. or CD, and this type of thing, where the, the uh, attitude is more descriptive and superficial, mm -hmm. that really go into the depth. I mean, the DSM whatever, now five. it's the five, five. that is the five, mm -hmm. and everybody around reading the five. Tell me something, from a practical point of view, what do I do by giving a poor guy who comes to see me a diagnosis? Well, I have to give a diagnosis to OHIP when I sit No, there. that's a different thing. <laughs> because you are, you are OHIP and they have to pay you. But if you are like me, that you are not with OHIP, and you OHIP don't have to pay yeah, you, yeah, yeah. but you pay, pay you directly, what do I do by saying so-and-so mm -hmm. is such a thing? Mm -hmm. What am I going to do by tagging the guy with, with the diagnosis? Mm -hmm. It's not going to help me. But one thing, if the person is suffering from anxiety, either it's phobic or even psychotic, mm -hmm. you give the same anti um, anxious medication. You don't need a diagnosis for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's depressed because of uh, b because of produced by a clinical depression or, or, or psychotic depression or produced by uh, environmental depression. You give this same antidepressant. So, so the DSM something that people have to memorize. Besides, perhaps a, a writing thing for the medical federation, <laughs> they come to go to review your notes. Or, 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 to, or to get your money from, besides that, is of no use to the patient. And it's expensive. Mm -hmm. Well, but people, but people are maker. very, <laughs> they go very much for psychiatry and yeah. the, the, uh, all of these letters they use. For instance, 
in the time I was a McGill student, uh, they talk about hyperactive, hyperactivity in children. Oh, yeah. You remember that? Of course. Yeah. Then nobody talk about uh, what is the name of that? Attention uh, you, deficit hyperactivity. Deficit. Yeah, bring it to me in, in, in letters and mm. ADHD. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. At that time was hyperactivity in children, mm -hmm. and they use amphetamine. Am I right? And then right. Now they have this new name with the same disease, and they use the same medicine with a different name, mm -hmm. Ritalin mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah, yeah, right. 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 When they were using that 30 years ago. Sure. Well, there's, yeah. there, there's a... But that, that, that represents millions of dollars to laboratory. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And there's a splitting going on, because mm -hmm. everybody knows that if there's emotional issues, or you want to use the word disturbance, you can't focus. Mm -hmm. And if, if, if you have some emotional turmoil, mm -hmm. disturbance, mm -hmm. or whatever going on internally, right, right. you right. can't focus. Um, right, right. Children, sure. the way they, because they haven't really learned how to mm -hmm. deal with their emotions yet, yeah. the way they deal right. with intense emotions is to run around. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So. Um, it may mean that there's some neural networking yes. not going yeah. on right, and some mm. of the neural yeah. uh, research going on now mm. is saying it is nurture, it, yeah, yeah. and that um, this... But you know what's happened with that? What? Well, hyperactivity is sort of passe, because these kids who are exhibiting symptoms when they're six, seven years of age now are diagnosed as bipolar, and they're given <gasps> antipsychotic agents. <gasps> With the the ease that they were given Ritalin uh, just recently. Oh my okay. God! That so is that is what's abuse. Happening. Well, it, it happens every day. Go to camp as to the sick kids and sit in a. That is clinic. abuse. I work with kids like that, and well, they, okay. they're not hyperactive and attention deficit no, disorder. When I finish, sad, I play they might with be a them. Bit sad or yeah. Whatever, and it, it, this diagnosis is readily made. Oh. The, the prevalence of that does, uh, that diagnosis. In the past uh, five years, it's double, tripled, whatever. It's, it's oh amazing. Boy. And the advertising or propaganda of the big pharma is at that level. That push, yeah. push, push, push. Yeah. And I hesitate to say that we had some, a couple of significant people in, from Canada who helped in that evolution or devolution. <laughs> Somebody say I was a bit paranoid mm -hmm. because in, the, in, the, in my book on white thoughts, Mm -hmm. The first chapter is on murder in the mind. Yeah. <laughs> I say there is a complicity, is a complicity, I mean, in people, right. uh, yeah. intuitively, yeah. to murder the mind. Yeah, okay. okay. So, yeah. and somebody told me that I was too paranoid, I mean, thinking that yeah. somebody was. Yeah. Right. But uh, yeah. I have seen that happen. Right. Um, uh, it, but you see, but the system doesn't like that thing, for instance, I won't say that you you have thing wrong when you talk about adopted children. Mm -hmm. There is no such a thing as adopted children. Mm -hmm. Children are natural beings. Mm -hmm. You know, they are born out of a uterus of a woman. They are adopted parents, mm -hmm. okay. and not adopted children. Mm -hmm. There's a child that adopts parents, and the parents are so ignorant that they will freely for sure I want to screw the child. Mm -hmm. Which is like all parents do, and more when they are not their own. Mm -hmm. So, and this is, I mean, most of the adopted children, unless they ha they're lucky to find somebody like Job, who really find something that really helped them to evolve and, and a genius, I mean, most of the time, really, are people who really have serious mm -hmm. mental issues. So, um, this is one other point is that, uh, from what I've been told, and some of this is across the couch from psychiatry. I'm sorry, say it again? From what I've been told, and across the couch from psychiatric patients, patients who are psychiatrists, is they don't teach psychotherapy at the, in the residency program at Toronto now. Okay. You are. You refer to a psychologist if they think of it. Mm. And then if that's you want to talk. If you mm. refer to a psychologist, mm. most likely it's CBT. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But they'll include that. that yeah, Which is a formula. CBT. Yeah, a formula as yeah. well, a boxing in formula. Yeah. Well, take autism. Yeah. Well, there is no autism in the tropics. Yeah. I was a child analyst. I worked as a child psychiatrist there for years in the unit. I never saw an autistic mm -hmm. child. 
are so many symbiotic children, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like Moller described, Wagner mm -hmm. Moller described. Mm -hmm. but I never saw, I saw one autistic child and he was from Central Europe. So autism is very much linked to culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had a boy that I saw and um, the teachers were trying to say he was autistic. The doctor was starting to say, because he was becoming sensitive to noises, sensitive to a lot of things. He and I played hockey for a year. And the, um, the interpretive stuff were the numbers on the chalkboard, the scores. When we first started, if I got one score and he had a hundred, my one might overtake his hundred. So we did interpretive work about um, how he could be overtaken by the one. Mm. Mm. And as we talked about, uh, uh, about what that meant to him, he was able to let me have more and more numbers. So he was becoming more and more independent and feeling good about himself. He was, he was almost elective mute. He wasn't wanting to go to school. He got tummy aches. He was, you know, anxious. And by the end of the year, he was, and he couldn't go to hockey, which was his favorite game to play in. He was a good ho hockey player. So, in that, in that what you describe it, it's very common. Yeah. You give an autistic child to a Filipino uh, uh, nanny and improve. Really? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Because the, what the kind of describe <laughs> is still truth. Eh? Mm -hmm. What kind of describe mm -hmm. that autistic children mm -hmm are born into very um, um, striving intellectual mother mm. who really reject the child who seem to be organic and mm -hmm. withdraw the affect mm -hmm. from the child mm -hmm. and the child identify with that withdrawal of the affect to become autistic but you nobody can see that. The first child I worked with um, at Madison Avenue House when I was 17 was severely autistic and mm. The second day I took him out, we went to the park, and because I didn't know anything about it, I'm swinging him, and I get the sense he needs me to be more like interacting with a baby. Mm -hmm. And I start talking to him like, like he's a baby. He's, in fact, he's in the baby swing because they're mm -hmm. afraid. And he peeked, and he looked at me, and he smiled. Mm -hmm. So is that what to be genetic, holding the head? How is it going? How does it respond to the environmental change, you know? Yeah. So as we worked together, eventually I took him around the room and I said, who's that in the mirror? And this is like four months later. He goes, me. Mm -hmm. And autistic kids aren't supposed to do that, right? No. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking that given there are 30,000 Filipino nannies, at least in Toronto, serving a certain socioeconomic class, there should be a massive decrease in autism. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure they are. Yeah. Because they are very friendly, very nice. But, there, but, there's, an, study. but there's an increase yeah. in, in maternal alienation because oh, of the, the nanny comes from a very different culture. Yeah, yeah but they, they also. Oh, if the they mother were, comes from a very different culture where but, uh, to be maternal is foreign. They're yeah. off working yeah. in their no, law firm. Yeah, that's true. And, that's true. And they're, they're you know, like in one case, they they just abandon their children. Mm -hmm. But for instance, I don't think I had the advantage of being working as a psychologist in two cultures that are completely different. Mm -hmm. I'm from the Caribbean, we're born in the Caribbean, and I work in Canada many times. I've been back and forth. So, and I can see the difference. So, for instance, you you. No, call somebody in, in, in Venezuela on the telephone and the, in the answer machine answer, you hang up. You want to talk to the person. Mm. Even in Canada, you call somebody and you answer the phone, they hang up. They want to talk to the machine. See, oh. so there are autistic traits in this culture. <laughs> we have to do with the weather. Really? Yes, <laughs> of course. People prefer to talk I to the machine and leave your message. Why, yeah. they talk to you. like I mean, I'm generalizing here. Yeah, yeah. I'm generalizing. Yeah. I but emailing, but emailing is a bit Yeah, you know, that's true. Texting yeah. yeah. You can get away with emoticons. Or yeah. Yeah. What happened about our group? You don't find so much because, well, yeah. you'll be surprised. So, because I think that our autistic, autism here within normal people, somebody, I think it was a guy who talked about autism and, and neurotics. Mm. Uh, a book or paper in, in England, I think. Mm. Yeah. 
But uh, there are many diseases that are culture bound. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, psychopathology is culture bound. It's a descriptive and culture bound. It's not metapsychological. It is the meaning behind the form that is important. And this is what mm -hmm. we have to look for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is important. the difference between psychoanalysis and psychiatry. Psychiatry is descriptive and superficial. It only goes for a diagnosis that is not practical at all, and a descriptive of psychopathology that do not help the patient. What is important is what is the meaning that is behind that. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's what provides the hope yeah. and the help to the patient. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we are taken by the tremendous, perverse, uh, influence exercised by psychiatry mm -hmm. in our environment. And I would say it may, mostly because, for instance, we, we, whenever we accuse that our science is not precise and exact, we, we feel like uh, uh, making a mistake. I mean, like um, uh, that we should not defend because the true mm -hmm. science is the one that is science and precise. Mm -hmm. I say, what well, mm -hmm. you're confusing the instrument of investigation with the phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Because if the instrument of investigation, psychoanalysis, were as precise as the instrument you would use to e examine the liver, you would never be able to understand the mind. Mm -hmm. Because the mind is unprecise. No, the mm -hmm. psychoanalysis is a science. Mm -hmm. But it's a science that I have to adjust well, to the imprecision of the... When I switched from biochemistry into psychology in my final term in biochemistry, two months into class, I felt this, like, preconceptual ideas. I was feeling this weird irritation. And one day I had a eureka. I said, I know what's wrong with psychology. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they, they are trying to be a science like biochemistry, where mm. you, have, mm. you have your chemicals. Concrete. Oh, sure. Very yeah, concrete. Yeah. And the mind, the, the, the yeah. object of investigation has yeah. so many different variables yeah. that you cannot yeah. observe it in a lab like that. Yeah, right. You have yeah. to use yeah. the uh, ethologist's yeah. approach. When I, did psychology, do observation. when I did psychology, the joke was, if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, the liver of the caveman is the same liver we have. Yeah. So we have... We have uh, evolved to the point where we are now in reaching to the caveman thanks to our mind. If, if our mind would like to be the liver, we would still be in the cave. Right. So right. it's the openness in the, of the mind and the abstractions of the mind that is really uh, what allows to... Mm -hmm. So then I, I think that we should really stop being given excuses when we are accused that the psychoanalysis is not a science. 